Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today, I got my man, Billy Keels, dialing in from Barcelona. Is that right? Barcelona, Barcelona, Barcelona. yes. Barcelona, <laughs> man. So this is crazy. Just, just I got to give some context for you, man, because you are, when we talk about experimenting in the lab, that is what you've done on the earth. 86 yeah. countries, five languages, you live in Europe, and yes, you still find your way to invest back home in the U.S., which is really interesting because we talk about long distance investing. You're doing a long yeah. real estate investing, but it's not just real estate, which I'm interested in talking about because you got some other stuff where you're really helping other um, corporate individuals like yourself, which yeah. is very interesting because the most refreshing part of when we connected, the reason why I actually DM'd you, I believe, A, you were in a mutual network, but you had in your LinkedIn, happy corporate employee. And I love that. Yeah. It's so refreshing. We don't get that enough. We have the rah, rah, quit your job, good rat race. But you're showing us that you can be happy at your corporate job, which has given you also a lot of opportunities to travel. And you can also build a business, which you've done as well, which I actually find very, very impressive because a lot of people, they come home, they check out, and you are finding a way to over deliver not only for yourself, as we were talking about offline, for your family, but other folks as well. So there you go. You have a real scientist in the lab in front of us here, experimenter that is doing it at scale, that is helping other people. Billy, man, welcome. Ruben, thank you so very much. I I really appreciate that intro. A couple of things that I love about what you just said is that you kept saying, I'm doing something and something and something and. And one of the big things that, that helps you to move forward is when you can get into the power of and. Because for so many years, I was trying to figure out, do I do this or that? Or do I do this or that? Like meaning, can I be a really good dad or a corporate employee? Or can I start my own business? Or can I go up the corporate ladder? And then I started asking myself the right question, which was how do I actually become a better father and a better husband and a business owner and someone who's adding value to other people? And it doesn't make it easy all the time, right? Sometimes we want to take the little easy pill, but it's just about asking yourself the right question. And then your mindset moves into a different direction. So I love that you started out that way. And I also want to talk to everybody that is here listening to us because I want to say something that is really important because Ruben, I know that you put a lot of love and a lot of heart into every single conversation. And if you're already listening and or watching, take a second, please make sure that you leave Ruben a, an honest review and a rating for this podcast because there's a lot of heart and a lot of effort and a lot of love that goes into each and every one of these conversations. And so as you're listening or you're running, just take a second, please. Uh, also as a fellow podcaster, because I know that that's something that's really important. And I know you put a lot of love into this. And I know each and every one of you that is listening now has just a couple seconds that you can leave that honest review and rating. So uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to this conversation with you, my friend, because I love what you're doing. I respect so much what you're doing and how you're leading uh, your team and making an impact on lives, man. Dang, Billy, you're not even going to warm up to it, man. You, okay, so I already started writing down notes because, first of all, thank you so much. That means a lot. I really do appreciate it. And speaking of the word and, I did leave that out. And I should know because we were just talking about this, about the podcast setup. You have a podcast, great branding, called Going Long Podcast. I did leave that out. I'm literally looking at you. We were just talking about it. And that's definitely you guys want to show love right back because Billy is doing a, a wonderful job. We we're just talking about this offline and that keep on cashflow.com. You guys got to check that out. But you just gave such a good nugget right in the beginning. This is why I said how, you're not even going to warm up to it. You said <laughs> instead of or you said how like that is so powerful to me because I, I really do think people do think that like, why not? Why can't you do more? So when you're starting to think of like, instead of doing this or that, 
and you start asking, how can I do this, 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 that, and that, what is the first thing, first of all, when did this happen? This mindset of like, okay, did you have like a, a, cause I know you, part of the thing that I love so much, Billy is like, you know, we talked about how it's such a luxury to have had the opportunity to see different parts of the world, different phases. So I guess for you, you know, you've like 86 countries, we talk about perspective. Was that at that time when you're thinking, Hey, I want, I saw something that I was inspired and I want to add it to my, you know, arsenal. Like, what did that look like? And then what was the next step for you as you started to add all, all these great things that you're doing? Yeah. So, I mean, and I would love to tell you that this was all kind of by design and mm. you got into this and I saw that, but, but it really wasn't, it, mm. but it's just one of the things that has continued to happen in life. And I, I guess one of the things that I, I have mentioned before, and I, I guess one of the things as a, as someone who is a recovering perfectionist, because I do recognize I'm a recovering perfectionist mm. that I always try to do so many things and just do it, me doing being the person that did it and all this other kind of stuff. And there was a certain point in my life and it was, you know, it was really on my my child, my oldest son on his third birthday. And I remember being um, leaving on his birthday like at six o'clock in the morning, something like that, a little bit before six o'clock, I was getting up and getting dressed and um, I was leaving and he was turning three. My wife uh, also was at home super early in the morning and our youngest child was one. And I remember getting in the elevator from our flat going down and going to the airport. And I just thought to myself, like something here is not right. Like I am doing all of this work in my corporate role to continue to move up, to be, continue to have a better lifestyle, to continue to have more income and to be able to be in these special moments with my family. And I was getting on a plane to go to a meeting that I didn't really even like having perspective that I didn't really care about because it was about going to a role that I, I was going to be in for a little while and then gone to another one. But it was what I was always told, like get a good job, get the, get, get the good grades, get the good job and get the promotion and continue to move up the ladder. And so at that point it was, you know, how do I do this or do that or do this or do that? And just in my heart, it felt empty because I was missing a really important moment in my life. And I and I and I, I wouldn't I know like that was one of the moments that just really sticks in my mind. Mm. But I do remember trying to ask myself, how do I continue to be happy in my job and still be able to be at the special moments that I really want to be for my family? And how do I start to have more control over my financial life so that I don't have to be in a position that I'm going to miss these moments anymore and how can i be present so that my children are actually and my children and my wife are happy because i'm actually around so although it wasn't something that was done by design it was just these little moments and this is one that really resonates and i remember and i will never ever forget that have helped me to get to a point now where it is what are the number like one most important thing is what are the priorities in my life and then how do i make sure that these priorities that are in my life that I can do as many of them as possible and put them together. So I can, you know, I can be a better father every single day. I can be a better husband every day and I can begin to have more control over my financial life, which is one of the things that is really, really important for me. So it's maybe a little bit of a long winded yeah, answer, but, but hopefully it gives you some perspective. No, interesting. But I think that in itself is by design, right? Because you've taken the time. I don't think, I think most people actually take the time to be like, Hey, what's a priority to me. Right. I, I mean, I don't know. Would you agree? Or I don't know. Again, we used the word jaded before. Maybe we do it often, but I, is that, was that always how you thought, or did you actually have that a change of like, Hey, I'm not operating from a place where I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I have priorities in place. I don't have any core values leading me. Is that, is that something that you transitioned into or fell into or kind of like you always were like that? Well, I've always had goals and objectives. Mm. And most of them were related to money because I don't come from money. I've watched my, I watched my parents mm -hmm. like bust their butts for a really long time to be able to put me and my brother and sister in, in really good school districts, right? Cause that's something that's very important at stateside if you're not going to private school or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so having seen them go through that, I knew that one of the things in my life because I didn't have it was financial security. And I wanted, and I've always 
set these kind of goals. And I guess there's, you said a couple of different things there. There was one which is about priority setting and another which is about values. And so the way that life is today or the way that I see it, those, those are two different things. However, they should be in a, there should be alignment between the two things. So although I knew that I wanted to continue to go out and every year was something that I would sit down and see if financially am I on track and am I doing exercise? But since then, that has also evolved as I've evolved as an individual. So it's it, 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 I've never been just kind of going by blindly, which I know that that happens for a lot of people. I did have some some kind of North Star, but it was really just about money, which definitely is it like having finances is important or financial wherewithal is important. But it's definitely not the only thing, because if you, you can be. You can you can be in poor health and have a whole lot of money and that money doesn't really mean anything. So I've become, I guess, even more focused on what the main priorities are in life. And they're definitely not just uh, definitely not just money. You said that you said priorities and core values are different. Do you think so? Well, I think the, I think that a lot of the value system that you can have. Uh -huh will like that's like I guess the way that I, I, I view value system is kind of how how are you living your day to day right like mm -hmm. how how are you living and your priorities are what is it that you want to be able to do and then when you figure out what it is that you're going to want to be able to do in my estimation you better have a whole lot of really strong whys behind that because if you don't have the real why you want to do what mm -hmm. you want to do those priorities don't really mean anything and you can still be living the life in the way that you want to be living, which I believe is your is your value system. So I guess in, in the way that my mental schema works, I see those as two things that are are different value system yeah. and priorities. Well explained. So question I'm dying to ask is, and I'm sure everyone who's listening, who's tuning in, who's getting a sense is, okay, why long distance investing? Because you're an investor, you're thinking, okay, I want financial freedom, you know, at least, you know, independence yeah. why long distance so can you give me just a little bit to kind of explain the story because i think the easy answer is is well i won't even tell you the easy answer you'll have to stick around and listen <laughs> to the yeah story. yeah so like how do you like, absolutely we want to hear that's yeah so, like what, so, give us some context as to like how you how because it seems again you're you're an experimenter so you it sounds yeah. like you've looked at a few different options or you experimented a few different things or uh, explored maybe a few different options. I mean, you, you seem to me, you said a, a, a um, recovering perfectionist. So I know that there was a lot that went behind making that call. That's why I'm asking that. Yeah, recovering perfectionist. And how do I get to be a long distance investor? Well, the, the, the reality is as someone who is a recovering perfectionist and an A student, right? I did what I was told. Like you do what you're mm -hmm. told when you're an A student and yeah. a perfectionist. And so what I was told was, get good grades and I got those good grades, get a good job and I got good jobs and move up. And I was worried about moving up, right? The corporate ladder. And also as it related to your financial life, cause you're making a lot of money, like you should be making money in that job that's giving you the promotion and all that stuff. And then on the outside of that, in your financial life, it's really about how do you make sure that you are maxing out and preparing for your future? And that means your 401k or in, in your, when that's maxed out your IRAs and stuff. And so I was doing that cause I'm a, recovering perfectionist and an A student. And so in 2000, there was something that was really interesting that happened. In 2000, there was this dot-com bubble and I'd been working for about five, six years. And so that was the first time that something happened and it just kind of, well, my stock portfolio took a hit and I was all worried and concerned because I didn't even like where I come from. If you were saving money, that was considered investing. And so I was saving money and now I was investing. So I was moving to the next level. Mm -hmm. But this investing, I was just blindly placing my money with somebody else because they told me that they showed me the sheet of paper and if I should put my money here and I was doing that. And so when I saw that decrease in the value, I was kind of like, oh, that was not really good. And I went back and I was freaked out and like what should happen. And so I got the, the, the line, which was, hey, listen, don't worry. Just make sure that you continue to put your money in. This is all going to come back. We're going to do something called dollar cost averaging. So over time, you're going to get back to where you need to be. I'm like, all right, well, listen, this is what they're saying. I'm, a, I'm an A student. So this is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just listening to this person. And as they were correct, because over time, then my money started coming back and my portfolio value started coming back. And I was like, okay, well, cool. You know what? I'm a good student. And this is what they told me. And this is what happened. And then like eight years later, my portfolio happened with the great recession and it took a 33% loss. And I was like, this doesn't feel good. 
And I remember like, thinking about my parents and my parents always say, hey, look, Billy, you know what? If, you know, they taught me the right, the skills and, and value set and stuff like that, right? And it was about, you know, if something happens once, Ruben, then shame on them. Yes. If the same thing happens twice, shame then who's that you. shame on? Then that's shame, shame on, on you, you right? Yeah. And so that happened to me twice. I put my financial life, my 401k, my IRA, and I put it in the hands of somebody else. And mm. I got really smacked in the face. And I was like, this is not cool. And so I came across this little purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and like a lot of people have come across and that kind of started, but I didn't finish it because I was in the US and I picked it up and then I put it down. And a couple years later, I actually picked up the book and I finished it. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is really cool. I can buy property. I can own property and I can earn about two to three hundred dollars a month consistently and I can have control control consistent cash flow cool that was amazing so I took all the lessons that I learned because there's a difference between the theory and, and putting that into practice and so I took the theory and I wanted to put it into practice here in Barcelona Spain where I live and I kept going through the numbers and I was going through the numbers and I was not sophisticated enough at all and like in the beginning you're never sophisticated right you're just sure. you're going through what you what you what you learn and you're putting it into practice and so when you start seeing that the numbers are not plus 200 and plus 300 it's negative 60 negative 75 negative 125 I was going well this doesn't these numbers don't work this is this is bad this doesn't work and so all the things about owning property, having more control and being able to do it where I lived here in Barcelona, Spain, it, they weren't working. And so mm. I had a couple of friends of mine that were like, hey, listen, Billy, but you're American, man. Like, why don't, you, why don't you buy in the United States? And I just remember looking at these friends of mine and I'm like, do you not see this Atlantic Ocean that's between here and where I would buy the property? Like that's four, five thousand kilometers or miles. That's in, like, why would I ever do that? And a couple of friends of mine said the same thing. And I was like, okay, well, after a couple of friends tell you a couple of things, you're like, hey, okay, well, maybe let me take a listen to this. And so then it started making sense. And then I started getting out of my own way. And then I started thinking about process over property. And I started thinking about the 20 some years that I'd already put into the corporate or almost 20 years at that point in time. And I started thinking, well, I, you know what? I can do this. I, plus I've got money that I want to put to work. I'm tired of reading these books and I just want to take action. So I became a long distance investor because I was looking to gain more control over my life, more control over my finances. And I started thinking more about process than actual property. And I had the capital and it was a matter of actually going out to build the team. So it wasn't anything that once again, I didn't have it by design, but more to your point, it was like experimenting and saying, all right, well, how do I actually go from this point where I am in my mind to actually making this a reality, taking the theory that I had from the books, which showed me one thing. But when I tried to apply it to my local context, it just wasn't working. So it was time to go somewhere where the context would actually fit into the model that I had in my mind. So. First of all, that, that's so interesting how that came together. But one thing I noticed is you said you're a good student. You're an A student. And I interpret that as you're very coachable. Um, were you always very coachable? Yes, I think so. I think I mean, so. And it's, it's so good to see because, and I think the reason why I want to highlight that is because um, I think if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, it's really important, like, one thing that Billy said was, you know, you said that once many people are saying something, you know, you put your ego to the side and you're like, okay, maybe I should consider this. And I think that's really important to do and, and, and remarkable. Um, and because you're coachable, pretty much anything that is in alignment with kind of like what we talk about, your values or et cetera, you can apply without having, again, it wasn't made out of thin air. You didn't have the blueprint before, but you can be coached to kind of go in that direction. So talk about now, I want to hear. So first of all, that's like, kudos to you because that's 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 really important. Like sometimes people are stubborn. No, this is this, is, but you're coachable. So now that you're coachable, what coach or what system or what process or what resource helped you put a team together to build out the process that you're talking about? What was that next step? Because if I'm listening, I'm like, hey, I'm coachable too. That's why I'm listening to this podcast. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm all in with, with what Billy is teaching. Uh, going long podcast and, and all the resources, what would be the next step for me? So I'll share what I did, not necessarily what I would do. Right. And mm. this is part of learning yes, sir. because you can learn from the mistakes of others. And I've made yes, a lot of mistakes, a whole lot of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and many of them were avoidable. But because mm. when I got started, 
I didn't know enough about um, different resources. Although I was listening to podcasts and I would, in the beginning, I really wasn't doing that because I tend to, in some of the things that can happen when you happen to be a perfectionist or a recovering perfectionist and an A student, you believe that not only you should, but no, but that you, yeah, that you should do everything, that you should do everything, meaning Y-O-U, meaning no one else. <laughs> and so what happened was even when I was here in Europe and I bought the properties, because I was thinking about money and properties, I was thinking about the specific opportunities is what I like to call them. And I guess this comes from my corporate experience. And I had the money and I bought the opportunity. I bought the deal. And so once I had the deal, then I, you know, I wanted to bring in and, uh, and, and start to, well, bring in the money because I was focused on the money and the money was coming in and the money was coming in and it was a great first opportunity. And then I realized that, Hey, listen, the, the, the residents were making phone calls or they were sending emails, but, or they were more sending emails and I would get it and the, they weren't receiving the proper level of service because I didn't have the systems in place because I wasn't thinking about it because I didn't speak to someone who'd already been where I wanted to go because I wanted to do everything because I was and am a recovering perfectionist and I was an A student. And so then I realized that I needed to create a system. And so I got an answering service and that answering service helped to provide more, more service to the residents. And then the residents were calling and then they would need issues that would happen in the late afternoon in the United States. And it was very early morning for me here in Europe. And I would get a, an email or a text message because now we had an answering service. And I was always behind the, I was always behind the eight ball, so to speak, because yeah. I didn't have the systems in place. So what I did, what I was fortunate enough to do is I knew that I wanted to create cash flow and I was in the right location, but I wasn't really crystal clear about the way and the systems that I was building. And so kind of, I did it the complete wrong way. Yeah. And so now one of the things that, I work with and help people to understand is first and foremost, you have to be crystal clear on what benefit is it that you want investing in tangible assets to provide you? Mm. Do you want some type of cash flow? Do you want some type of tax benefit? Do you want equity build up over time? Or do you want some type of appreciation, right? These are the typical four things that everybody talks about in real estate slash tangible assets. After that, then you go to the specific location that is going to give you the highest probability of being able to achieve those goals, right? Mm. And then after you're in that location, this is the part of the, of the long distance and long distance investing thesis that is without a doubt the most important part. And this is what you're asking about, which is building the team. And then once you build the team, it does not matter, Ruben, if you have afterwards, you start buying assets that are large pieces of energy equipment, if mm -hmm. they are very uh, large multifamily properties, if they're a mobile home park, or if they're single family uh, residences, because you have complete alignment on those four things. And then going back to the team aspect, it's about how do you make sure that whatever asset that you want to be able to purchase, that the team, number one, that they have a strong ecosystem in the location that you want mm -hmm. to make sure that you're investing your, your time, energy, and assets. And whether you're doing this actively, as an active investor or you're looking to invest passively with others, it's important that you understand the team aspect because the team is who is going to be actually managing the day to day operations of your goals, your dreams, your interests and your desires, which everybody else calls how much money are you putting in on a deal? Right. Because ultimately that money is really represented by other things. So it's yeah. about being able to recognize who is the team, being able to build the team and, and being able to build the team. Ruben, I, I don't believe that there's a secret bullet. There's a lot of different questions that you can ask, but it's about being able to develop a relationship and develop a strong relationship, one that can start online or start through a referral. Typically, if I want to go to a new location, because I know exactly that I'm trying to yeah. have more tax benefits and cash flow, and I found the location. And then I would ask, Hey, Ruben, do you have a specific referral in this area that does X, Y, Z in the type of asset class that I want to invest in? If you say yes, then I'm going to pick up and I'm going to get in touch with them. I'm going to make phone calls with them. As it starts to make more sense, they see that I want to build relationship and make purchases. Then we develop and we move to Zoom sessions or Skype or Google Meet, whatever you use. And then yep. eventually, I believe, especially as an effective long distance investor, which means that you're looking to build 
significant assets in a specific location that you're going to need to put your money where your mouth is and you're going to have to get up on a plane or on a train or in an automobile and go those hundreds or thousands of kilometers to meet with the team that's actually going to be doing the day-to-day -day management of the asset and of those goals, dreams, and desires. That's awesome. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, you gave so much, um, and I'm just looking at my notes. Cause that's what we do here in the lab. We take notes because uh, we're coachable as well. Nice. Um, so one, I, I do have to give it to you because I think there's two types of perfectionists out there, right? There's the one that, you know, everything needs to be perfect before one gets started. But what I did here with you is that, and maybe, and, and maybe this is the beauty of it too, is not knowing what you don't know. You pulled the trigger without having the systems and processes in place. And you know what? I, I The reason I like asking this question, Billy, and I don't know if you would agree with me, like, I think it's good because that you pull the trigger without having the systems in place. And because hindsight 2020, right? It's, you know, you're building momentum. And the reason I'm saying this is, is that there's the person who, you know, doesn't ever get started because they want everything to be in place before they get started. But the reality is that we're getting better every day and we're still figuring out, you know, some of our blind spots, we're still closing out some gaps. So, I don't think you're a perfectionist, even though you thought you're a perfectionist. I think there was a place where at one point you just said, let me just do it and I will figure it out along the way. Would you agree with that? So there's a couple of things that you just said that I think are fantastic. And it, what you reminded me of is it's like that person. And I, I talk about this every once in a while where when you want everything to be perfect, that means that would be the equivalent of before you take action. That would be the equivalent of you saying and, and kind of go back to where people were before uh, this particular unique moment in time. But if you're leaving your home and you're going to your office, right? Imagine that you would never leave your house until every single stoplight was green. Unless the, every mm. single stoplight was green before you and, and you would not move from the first one until they were all green, you would never go anywhere. Like you would and never make it to the office. And the ever. crazy part is if you don't get out the house, you might not realize that there's an actually another direction you can go. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Right? So and, and so and so even with that, what happened with me is I lost the most valuable asset ever. But the thing that actually propelled me to take action, even though I had imperfect information, was I didn't want the third time to happen to me. I was so, I was so like ready to make sure no matter what happened that I took action, that it was time to take action because I had already lost control of the financial part of my life two times. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to let it happen a third time. Yeah. And so even now a days when the stock market's up and the stock market's yeah. down and this is happening and that's happening, I don't care <laughs> because I've, I'm not going to let that happen to me a third time. I, di I didn't let it happen to me a third time. And so that probably more than anything, Ruben, was what was really the, the driver behind saying, OK, look, this is kind of freaking me out because I don't have all the information and I don't really know. I don't have it all. But you know what? In the back of my mind, I kind of felt this thing was getting ready to potentially happen again. And I did not want that to happen. Yeah. And so that I think, well, I, that for me was more the driver than being worried about not having everything, all my I's dotted and T's crossed. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. One thing I personally uh, really connected with when you were talking is the, the I, uh, cause I, you know, I just, I did a TEDx talk on this on, you know, stop asking, how can I, and start asking who, uh, and, and what I loved about what you said to, to piggyback, what you actually said is you said, well, you know, whenever you have a question, ask the person who's already been there. And then you ask for their referral. Like, who do you use for X, Y, Z? I mean, and, and, and we're in this day and age where, you know, you and I connected, uh, we're supposed to connect in New York, but we missed the opportunity, but we've connected online and you here you are in Barcelona giving me some tips while I'm here in New York. And, and so what a time to be alive where we can send a text, where you can get on a call uh, with, with individuals like yourself and, yeah. and get the information. So I think, you know, going to the source, yeah. that's prime, man. No, it's definitely, it's, we, we are living in a very, very um, 
unique moment in time. It's we're very fortunate to be able to connect so quickly. And it's just it's a major, major advantage and massive opportunity. Massive. Absolutely. What were you what were you interested in? Because you talk about cash flow tax, you know, advantages, equity. Uh, what was the one thing for you? You had just lost your asset or your, you know, a lot of your portfolio, you said 33%. I mean, poof. Um, what were you looking for? And with someone who has, you know, a job like yourself where you're making decent income, what were you looking for? Yeah, so one of the things that happened, I, I have always been interested in cash flow. Mm. Cash flow, like right, just rightfully recur, so, recur, right, recurring streams of revenue. <laughs> I, I ain't mad at you, brother. That's yeah, a good. It, that's a good look. And so, <laughs> my whole thing was my whole thing was cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash yeah. flow. And then when you're also somebody who's working in a a corporate role where you're you're very very fortunate, you're you're paid a great salary. And when I say salary, I'm talking multiple six figure salary, especially when you do a, a fantastic year and, and you're in sales. It's highly demanding. So you're working really, really a lot of hours. And when I mean a lot of hours, meaning over 50 plus 60 hours a week, just to be co concrete. And so one of the things that happened as I started worrying about mo how do I make more money? I was making more money. And then I started realizing, well, hang on a second. Every single <laughs> dollar that I'm making or euro that I'm making, now we're getting to a point where 50 cents on every dollar is going to somebody else. I'm doing 100% of the work. <laughs> and how do I figure out now, how do I keep making, how do I make more money? And more importantly, how do I keep more money, mm. right? Because when you start recognizing that all of those hours, I'm the one putting those hours in, I'm the one who is not at certain events, or I'm the one who is you know, working while everybody else is doing something else. So to, to complement the cash flow, which I am still interested in, I then started becoming really interested in, okay, the tax aspect of, okay, there are a lot of different, especially in the U.S. tax code, and I'm not a tax advisor, I'm not giving anybody any type of advice on now or anything that I would say in the future, but when you start recognizing that the whole tax aspect is something that is very, very important, especially for people who are high wage earners that have a high net worth accredited investors like a lot of the people that I'm typically working with now yeah. and a lot of them are first generation just like me where mm. you think okay well now I'm in this place and I don't know who I can talk to because I've amassed this net worth that would make me an accredited investor but none of the people that are around me are accredited investors if I start talking to them about what I'm doing or what I have that may not be like they won't really know how to help me even though they would want to because they've never been there or they're making X amount of money every year because they continue to do a great role in their bonus salary or their bonus, or they're just, they make, you know, maybe they're making three, $400,000 a year. They're high paid professionals. And so that aspect also has now become really important for me personally, and also for the people that I'm helping, which is, okay, we want to continue to make more money because when we make more money, we're able to do more things with our family, with our loved ones, we're able mm -hmm. to do more philanthropic ventures. And it's also important to the, the, the money that we're making or the, or the, um, the currency that we're making or generating. Yeah. How do we also keep more of that so that we can do more for other people? Got it. Uh, Billy, let me ask you, uh, and I know, again, you're not a you know, tax, <clears throat> um, you're not giving tax advice or anything, but when you're outside of the country, are the benefits just as the same or better? Or how do you get double taxation? Like, can you just maybe give us some quick hindsight on that? Because I haven't really, you know, yeah, talked sure. to so, people and investing I'll, outside of the yeah, US. And I, inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I love that you say that. And I'll just say it once again. So I'm not giving anybody yeah, tax advice, yeah. just looking and understanding how things work because I've been living outside of the United States yeah, for, yeah, tw yeah. for 20 yeah. years, right? Um, but, but one of the things, and it will depend a lot on the country that you live in. So depending on the country that you live in, it depends on what types of treaties they have or mm. not with the U.S. because we're going to keep it very U.S. centric. Yeah. So depending on what may happen, you may earn a lot of money in an outside of the United States. Let's say you live in and we'll use Italy, right? You live in Italy and you earn you're an accredited investor and you earn four or five hundred thousand dollars, the equivalent of that. And because you live in Italy, and I don't know if they have it or not, and this is like I said, we're using an example that yeah. there's a double taxation. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that because you're paying so much in taxes, you're paying, you're declaring and you're paying in Italy, there may be 
a way that in the United States, because you're paying more and there's a treaty that exists between Italy and, and, and the U.S. in this example, that you would have to do the declaration in the United States. However, because of the treaty, you only pay in uh, in Italy. Right. Mm. So those I'm, are I'm, I mean, I'm that's wondering, a, that's I'm wondering if there'll be again, we're not we're not going to get too deep into the weeds. But I'm just curious. That's why I'm asking questions. I'm wondering if if that's advantageous with the currency difference. Is there like a or does. So yeah? well, this is this is one of the things that happens for a lot of international long distance investors is currency and currency fluctuation is something that comes like I deal with people on a yeah. weekly basis that are that are saying, hey, well, should I buy? Should I not? Should I invest now? Should I wait? Right, right, right. Well, it goes back to the same thing. Like it depends on compared to what. So if you're worried about a currency fluctuation that is over a, a certain period of time, if you know, I, I always like to talk about this thing called return on sleep or ROS. Is it ROS positive <laughs> oh, or I not? Mm. Right. And, and that is it is. OK, well, if, if, if no matter what you where you place your capital, if you place your capital somewhere and it's going to allow you to sleep well at night, then you're going to get a positive ROS. If you are placing your capital somewhere and you're worried about the currency fluctuation or you're worried about the sponsor or you're worried about the operator or you're worried about the asset class, then it's going to be ROS negative and you're not going to sleep well at night. And I don't care what the return is. If you are not getting a return on sleep, it could be a 50 percent return. And if you're not sleeping well at night, not worth it. Definitely not worth it. So uh, maybe a little bit more of a long winded answer to your question, but that oh. kind of uh, the currency fluctuation is something that definitely comes up in any conversation for people that are living outside of the United States or living outside of that specific currency yeah. and earning outside of that currency. Because sometimes there I've also spoken to people that live outside of the United States. They're living in a country where they still earn in dollars. So they're not worried about any currency fluctuation, although they live outside of the United States. They're, they're worried about the currency fluctuation for their day to day living situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. but not necessarily for investing in, in opportunities that are based in the United States. Yeah, I was actually I was thinking more as an advantageous thing, right? Like if the euro is stronger or something or the pound or whatever, I wasn't even thinking about the other way around. But I guess you're right. I'm a risk adverse perspective as well. You would have to. You know. Cor correct, because it, you, you, it could be in, in the same day if you wanted to buy and sell. Right. Given a specific currency exchange rate, on one hand, it could be an it could be an asset. And then if you have to sell the exact same day, it could be a liability. So you end up at zero. It's, it's okay. a zero sum. It's a zero so, sum so, game. So this conversation right here, I feel like we could have lost 50 percent of people are like, yeah, that's too much. There's no way I'm just going to stay. How do you overcome that? Uh, and, and we're, we're going to talk about how you invest with others as well. So is this do you for someone who's listening that like, okay, I'm interested in this, but like bro like this is already starting to sound like you know barriers you're, you're you seem excited to answer this one billy what, what you go ahead well it's just because i deal and i talk to people about this all the time every yeah. day right so yeah, this, what is the what is what do you tell me if i'm like i'm thinking of it what is it how do you reassure me if you need to or how do you even say hey this is how i overcame it. yeah so it's it's at least the way that i look at it is number one it's always compared to what and it was going back to what we were talking about in the very yeah. beginning. So if you are in a place where the best type of return that you can possibly get, and I'm just going to exaggerate here a lot again, once again, is a 0.05% return. And you are in a position where you can, you can get, and we're going to exaggerate here again, is you can get a, I don't know, compared to 0.5%, you get a 4% return, right? The question then becomes, is it going to allow you to sleep well at night to place your capital somewhere where you have a risk of currency fluctuation of X percentage points to be able to for it to make sense for you to invest your capital in some other place? Yeah. And so you have to take into consideration, well, I'm going to place my capital somewhere at 0.05 percent. I'm not actually going to be able to speak to a person. I have to dial a 1-800 number or a 900 number or whatever number you country you live in. You're going to have to wait for people to after 35 minutes of waiting on hold, they're going to answer your phone call and they're still going to tell you the same thing because they're reading from a script that they would tell the next person. Or do you talk to someone who you're going to have the potential upside to have 8 percent or 8, I think there's eight times the return you're yeah. going to be able to speak to the person. They're going to be able to tell you exactly where the asset is. And you, you know, you have a position where it's unlikely that you're going to also have an eight times currency fluctuation. Well, that may make sense for you. 
But I go back to the return on sleep. If that doesn't make sense for you, then you know what? Move on. Don't worry about it. Don't just stay and continue to get a 0.5% and sleep well and and do that for a really long time. Because one of the things I used to try to do, Ruben, is try to convince people like, hey, this is great. But if people are not, if you're not going to be able to sleep well, it doesn't matter. (laughs) But but what what I have found overwhelmingly is for people that are looking for consi- specifically consistent cash flow over time, th- I haven't found a market that beats the U.S. market. And I know we shouldn't s- generalize because every location in the U.S. is different. It's very different, Columbus, Ohio versus New York yeah, City. Of course. But yeah. in general, there are a at lot a more opportunities. At a macro level, there are many more opportunities to create consistent cash flow, which is something that I enjoy and, and a lot of the investors that work with me also enjoy. Yeah. So um, I've, I've heard of yeah. that. Is it is it because... Uh, I'm curious, is it because there's just more multifamily here? Is that what it is? Because I've heard of that. For example, in Canada, apparently there isn't as many. Um, apparently the U.S. like has this, the apartment uh, pool is bigger. Is that what it is? Maybe I'm just, I'm just well, maybe I'm wrong. I, well, I mean, I, I, be, I believe, I'm not, not an expert in, in geographical locations mm. and things like that, but when you consider that the the number, of, and I just use the, the, like the number of cities that are a, a million uh, people or more, there are a lot more of them in, in the United States than mm. than there are throughout Europe. I think in the United States there are 50 different cities that have a million people or more, I believe. And, and if you look at the same thing across all of the different European capitals, I believe that they're half of that. I believe, right? And oh, yeah. so someone can fact check me and go and, and check that out. But yeah. and that just gives an idea. And there's also a dynamic where there are a lot. There's a lot just a lot more movement in the United States. It's not uncommon for someone to be from Columbus, Ohio, live in uh, Arkansas for a year or five years, and then they move from there to someplace in uh, Georgia. Maybe they move to Atlanta. There's a job there, and then they move to Seattle. So there's a lot more movement, and there's just a lot more, people are a lot more used to that. Whereas if you go to someplace like France, even if you're from a small town, at some point you've probably had the opportunity to move or live in Paris, a chance to live or go to school uh, somewhere down south in maybe Marseille or Lyon or something mm-hmm. like that. But there are there are a lot fewer cities in in the European countries, mm. at least that I've visited. And so there's a lot higher concentration. And because there's a lot higher concentration, there are everybody's going for the same jobs, which is driving up the available real estate. And typically, oh. if there's a lot less availability, there is a lot less supply and a lot more demand. Then what does that do? That throw, that rolls up the prices for the specific asset. So, OK, we got Professor Kiel's in the building. This is economics. One. Well, I didn't even know that's, that's, that's so interesting. How come that comes full, uh, full circle? Um, and you talk about the mobility. We're seeing this a lot now in this day and age with the virtual work that's happening. You got more, tons yeah. of people from California and the northeast going down to the south with tax friendly states like georgia florida uh, or even just even just next door to idaho oh absolutely so i mean you talk about movement yeah and 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 to put things in perspective i know we were talking about this offline like i spent some time in canada and canada has more land than america from what i know and there's 30 million people or at least last time i checked in the u.s has more than 300 million so you talk about the amount of people per square footage uh you're right why would canada need more apartments it has literally a zero less uh than than uh our, than than um than the u.s does um that's really interesting okay cool so um i want to put this like full circle because yeah. you know one one thing i want to ask you is you, you you got the confidence and or you decided to pull the trigger and remove the uh, recovering perfectionist idea i actually don't believe you're a perfectionist i think you're a good student you're coachable and you went with what made sense I uh, also know your numbers. You just gave us an economic breakdown. So appreciate that. So what was the first, did you start small when you went back home? Did you start big? Did you do it by yourself? Did you partner with someone? What was that like? And then, and we'll connect that to where, what you're doing with people today. What was the, what was that first year or, or, or a few years like in, in the beginning? Yeah. So in the, in the very beginning, I just, I knew that I had money and I wanted to get t- started. So I wanted to test. I didn't want that third strike to happen again in the on in a the control market. control I, I, I yeah i definitely wanted control and i wanted cash flow so that was my yeah. that was my real focus and I, the books made it seem simple and i ended up buying my very first property it's one that i haven't really talked a lot about i mean i've mentioned a couple of times but 
Uh, I bought a property. It was they were asking just short of a hundred thousand dollars for it. I mean, just to give you some numbers as well, and they were asking just short of a hundred thousand dollars. I uh, had the money to put the down payment. So where was I, that, I, by the way? In New Jersey, in New Jersey, in gotcha. South Jersey. Yeah, and so I ended up buying that property. Uh, I ended up buying it for just short of eighty thousand dollars. It was seventy-seven thousand dollars. I ended up putting another twenty thousand, so brought it back to about the hundred thousand they were asking for. But the the part that really made it for me was it was someone who was a motivated seller, meaning they did not want the property that their uh, mother had passed away. They were looking to not own the property. They just wanted to move to the coast and things like that. So it was it was it was a, a an opportunity that worked out for both of us. How did you find the uh, deal? MLS through the MLS and yeah, you through, had through someone a, had a, access, an, an, agent, an yeah, agent an agent that was helping me that was working that I met through you know multiple people because once again I just was looking to buy the property and I didn't know I didn't even know anything about tax or sorry not tax but financing options so I ended up meeting mm -hmm. someone at the bank the person at the bank introduced me to someone who was a general contractor the general contractor introduced me introduced me to um, the the introduced me to the um, um, to the agent, to the to the agent. So the agent uh, then put me on the MLS, and the MLS kind of got me uh, in visibility of this particular opportunity. But what happened was the it was a duplex. So the duplex was we renovated the duplex, and then we rented each side out for fourteen hundred dollars a side, and the mortgage was two hundred and sixty dollars. And I thought to myself, well, you said this is a, you said yeah, what now? Yeah, yeah. I, I said yeah. You heard me correctly. Two thousand eight hundred dollars is what we were renting it for. And their mortgage was two hundred and sixty dollars, and so when we added on the the taxes and insurance, it moved to six hundred dollars. And so the what we were clearing every month, I was like, wow, they said two to three hundred dollars a door, and this is much more significant than that. And so that was what was happening, and so that was my first experience, and it was super positive. What I didn't know is what I was mentioning earlier. A couple months later, when you have these homes that had been around for such a long time, almost 100 years, that there were a lot of deferred maintenance. And so I wasn't sophisticated enough to know that these things would be coming up. But what I tell you is I was focused on cash flow. And this was like a cash flow machine. Yeah. And so it was such a positive experience. But once again, I was trying to do everything. And that's where I started. So I've actually never even purchased a single family home. I don't, I don't even... Um, know what that is like. So, mm. um, but the pro I understand the process. So the process is pretty pretty similar. So, but that was the very first property that I had, and it, it was the first experience that I had. And I'm I'm very fortunate once again because it was a positive experience to get started, yeah. especially for the first couple months. That I was motivated to buy another one like four months later, and I bought a quadplex, and then about a year later I bought another one, and then eventually I had to stop because there was so much capital coming in, and I started realizing I'm still working this day job. I was a young father. And a bunch you, of you said you happening. had to stop because there was so much capital going in. There was so much cash flow being kicked off from the properties, meaning the cash flow was leaving the properties entering to my bank account. There was so much of that that I had to like I like, like I just needed to kind of get things under control and actually get system in. Like I felt like I needed to get a system in place because things were happening positively. But so you had quickly. you had a money problem. Is what I, I had a money problem. Yeah, I had a money problem. Just, a just positive money in, problem. Slowing in, just getting smacked in the face with dollar bills yeah. that's awesome yeah. so the, the the next phase of that was the apartment is that am i correct was it apartments no before that i bought a, i actually bought a mobile home park so mm. when so i actually stopped buying properties for about 18 months something but like why, that why is that because the money problem that was coming in there was a lot that was going on in my day job it just, i, don't, I actually don't think family. i understand that what do you mean by you had a money problem so was it just like it got too overwhelming i'm trying to what do you mean by yeah that? so there was such a large influx of capital coming into my bank account and so many then other um uh needs from operationally that was happening and i didn't have the systems in place and i knew that i if i just kept buying properties it was just going to compound up on compound upon compound the the operational problems so what were the, I, I, what were the I, operational problems well because i did i didn't have a property manager i didn't have um i, I didn't have a, an ecosystem built whereas today i don't even buy any type of property unless they sign I'm off. No, well unless i'm clear on why i what i what it is that i want to be able to do like do i want tax benefits like because now i'm really interested in tax benefits like something mm. that's huge important to me is something that's hugely important to, to my investors because accredited investors once again want to continue to to make money but more importantly keep 
the capital. Yeah. And so if you're looking to have cash flow, then it's cash flow. And then you go to the location. And then once you go to the location, then you do the work to build the team. So mm -hmm. I don't, I do not either bring investor capital or go and place my own capital into any place unless I actually know the team. Because in my opinion, especially as a long distance investor, when you're placing your capital or, or looking to place your own or other people's capital, there's a huge responsibility to make sure that the team that's going to be managing the day to day operations is world class, that they understand exactly what they need to be doing on a day to day basis, proactively, reactively and things like that. And I didn't have any of that infrastructure in place and I didn't even know how to do it. So did I had you, to stop to get you. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Billy. I just want to make sure because you, yeah, you yeah, drop no. a lot of uh, good knowledge. I want to make sure it doesn't slip through the cracks. Did you then start investing in the same places first or were you actually scattering and, and kind of going, you went from New Jersey to other places or did you just stay in New Jersey? And it stayed in New Jersey. I just stayed okay. in New Jersey. I just rinsed and repeated in the, like literally in the same mm -hmm. place, That's literally good. in the same so, place. So, so now for that, county. for that team, are you going like a third party or are you kind of just kind of bring people in house? Like how does that team look so, like and who are those members? Yeah. Yeah. So eventually what I ended up doing it, it, I ended up contracting property manager. Then I had somebody that was actually watching the properties on a day-to-day -day basis. So once again, it's not the way that I would recommend someone do it, but it was the way that I was doing it. And I was learning a lot about the things that you should do and the things that you shouldn't do. But more importantly, I found people that could help me to not have to be working literally around the clock, 24 hours a day in my day job, in the evening, in the U.S., the six hour time difference and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so that is how I initially started. Mm -hmm. And now it's about making sure that I am vetting the team that understands the specific location where we're going to be investing. And they also are aligned with helping us to make sure that we're either optimizing on tax benefits, we're optimizing on cash flow, yeah. on equity buildup or whatever the case may be. So um, it is very interesting. So, so what would you have, what wouldn't you have uh, done um, that, you know, is, you know, you said you would have done things one way. What would you have changed? Personally, I would not have changed anything because I wouldn't be here um, now with retrospect. And if I were telling someone else, yeah, yeah. like, make sure that you have a team in place. And but you like, mentioned but, something about salary. Is that is that something that you wouldn't have done? You would have contracted it out or is that what you said or? Well, a full time um, person or was that not the case? Uh, no, I, I would probably it would have gone just to make sure that I had the right property management team. Mm. Um, I, one of the things I would say is if it's a large enough scale, right? So if you're doing a larger type of syndication and you're bringing in capital and you're actually buying a business and I would consider buying a 200 unit asset and uh, buying a business at that point you would probably want to look to either have a team that is managing just that property yeah. or bringing that in house into what a lot of people will call having a, a vertically integrated stack, meaning that you're raising the capital and you're also operating the specific facility. But that would depend on once again, the size of the asset or the business that you're buying in Got my it. opinion. Got it. All right, cool. So just to recap, re resume real quick. So, uh, okay. So interesting. So you were talking about, so you, it was about putting a team and infrastructure in place. I'm going to talk about one of the things that we actually don't talk about enough. You, you talk about cash flow, tax benefits, equity. You mentioned ATM machines and, you know, energy equipment. Tell me how you came about this. Again, we talked about how coachable you are. How was that opportunity? Like, how did that come across your desk when you went into real estate and then all of a sudden we're doing ATM? Again, you talk about bringing returns on investment and return on sleep. So how did yeah. that opportunity come to the table? Yeah, so the so the, the the ATM thing was something that I did passively with someone else because I was looking for a portion of my portfolio to just create consistent cash flow, right? Yeah. And, and ended up through relationships, I, I met with someone who was very strong, who was working with, a, once again, a world-class operator. Yeah. And so it was a place where I, cause I was also at that point, point in time, I just found out what passive investing was. Cause I was doing all this stuff before and I didn't know that there was a, a world called passive investing. Like I didn't even yeah, recognize yeah. that. And so when I found that I was like, oh my gosh, I can put my capital here. I can keep doing what I do. And this is going to give me consistent monthly returns. So that was the thing that worked really well. And it's something that continues to work really well as a passive investor. And so then through relationships, I, I met, uh, two fantastic, uh, people, two fantastic ladies who introduced me to a specific opportunity because I was having a problem. And that problem was uh, be, 
I, as someone who is an accredited investor and I was, I was at a point where I, every single year, like I'm not a, a um, what do you call it? I am not a real estate professional, right? Because I have a corporate job. And so one of the things that I didn't realize when I was getting started in, in real estate investing is when I would place my capital somewhere, like this was something called passive income, but passive income by the IRS standards. And so as I was placing my capital, I was working my day job. I'm not a real estate professional. And so every year I would get this thing called passive losses. And, the, and the, every single year it would look like more and more passive losses on my properties. And then I was investing in the other stuff. And it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was like, well, how do I use this? And I'm like, well, you can't. <laughs> I'm like, well, why not? And he said, well, because you're, you're not a real estate professional and these are passive losses. And I thought, well, this is not cool because I'm doing all the work. And so when I talked before, it was great to be able to receive the cash flow. And then a, a lot of the cash flow was also tax sheltered within specific types of investments that I was having, right? My, they were tax efficient. But I was then starting to get into a place where I was like, well, I would like to be able to find a type of asset where I can, as a busy professional, a non real estate professional. So I just, I like my day job and I have a excess capital and I'd like to be able to put it in something that can also help me with my adjusted gross income, like meaning my active income. And that's when we came across an opportunity around energy equipment and it was a, around carbon capture equipment. And this is something that is really tied into for a lot of large energy companies. They want to be able to do things that are much more socially responsible and also help with getting to the net zero emissions. Mm. And so when you have an opportunity where you think, okay, well, I like my day job, I'm earning great money and I'm looking for something where I can invest passively. I can do something that's socially responsible. It's going to help create double digit returns for me. And at the same time, it can also help me create tax benefits. Then I wanted to find out more about this and I wanted to do more of this. And so now because I had a specific problem that I was trying to solve, which was I wanted to create consistent conservative returns. I wanted to do that in a, a shorter amount of time. And I also wanted to be able to get tax benefits that I could potentially be able to apply to my adjusted gross income, which is my active income. That is what really took my attention to the, um, to the, to specifically to the energy sector and to this specific opportunity. So that was where I've been focusing a lot of more of my time and my energy because I'm helping people that are in a situation and looking to solve a similar problem that I was trying to solve. So, yeah, but, so they, it, but, but at the end of the day, Ruben, yeah. they came through relationships. Got it. And is this you being uh, for the ATM machines? Are you doing it with someone or are you the spearheading the entire kind of, no, you know, no, that, that yeah. ecosystem? Yeah. So with the, with the, with the ATMs, it was just something that I was doing passively yeah. with, with the energy equipment. That's something that I'm actually, I've, I've been putting together a five or six C. So for accredited yeah. investors, uh, the wow. type. This is a this is an opportunity specifically for accredited investors with the uh, with the energy equipment. And it, like I said, it's something that is, it's has really strong tax benefits. So if you're someone who yeah. is earning, you know, you're you know, as, as an accredited investor, you're at least earning two hundred thousand dollars a year, or you mm -hmm. have a, a million dollars in in, uh, in net worth, not including your uh, your home. If that's something that is interesting to you, I mean, this is something that I didn't know a lot about, which is a lot a lot of times why I now talk about you being a. a someone who's interested in investing in tangible assets, because it's really understanding the type of asset, what is the benefit that you're looking to derive once again, if it's cash flow, if it's tax, oh, yeah, right. these types of things. So, so now with the energy equipment, it is something that I am actually spearheading. It's something that I am syndicating capital for. Wow. And is this based in the, in the U S as well? Yeah, it's all, it's all U S based. Yep. So, and lastly, are you using the exact same kind of team or it's completely different infrastructure? So it's a different team. It's a different team, different infrastructure. However, it's the same principle. The principles are the same. It is working with people, working with teams that are world-class in what they do. So in the same way that you wanna work with a world-class operator for your property management, for your, for your mobile, for your um, multifamily residents, it's the exact same thing for your mobile home parks and it's the exact same thing for your energy equipment. And okay. so having been able to do that and forge those relationships and build those relationships is now something that I can take forward to other accredited investors who are interested in, in understanding more about how you can potentially uh, help to, to, to have tax benefits against your adjusted gross income and create double digit returns.
Tom. That's the POC proof of concept proof for of concept. ROS return uh, on your sleep. I love that. And that <laughs> Billy, you brought us full circle. I, I, you know, you talk about working with other people. Um, how can people best work with you? I know we connected on LinkedIn. Um, you're obviously, you got a going long podcast, which, um, I, 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 you're doing a remarkable job. You've been talking about branding. I think, you know, your branding is just so strong because you're, you're living and breathing it. Uh, and I think that's important uh, that people want to work with someone who is, is, is walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Um, so I give you kudos to that. And I salute right back at you, my friend. But if there's anywhere, I know there's, you got keep on cashflow.com, Billy kills, uh, com, which I believe is, uh, is the same place. Where can we find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, you, you just, you broke it down, Ruben. So the, the first and foremost, you can find out a lot about what we're doing at billykeels.com. It takes you to the same place. And we're also going to be doing a lot of, uh, we're updating and bringing a lot more um, value to everybody that's going to be going to the page. I love connecting with people on LinkedIn, uh, as you know, Ruben. And the one thing I guess I would ask is for everyone, as you're listening or watching us, when you go to LinkedIn to connect please make sure that you let me know that you just watched Ruben and I have this conversation. It's just gonna help us to continue the conversation in a much faster way. Um, a lot of times also too, people are interested in long distance investing. Like we, I talked about some of the different mistakes that I made. If anyone's interested in knowing about some of the major mistakes that you should avoid as a long distance investor, I also uh, wrote a, an ebook for you. You can pick that up at billykeels.com forward slash seven mistakes, either the number or writing it out, doesn't matter. And if anybody wants to just chat and find out more about you know, what it's like being a high paid executive and you're looking to do something else, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today, feel free to go to bit.ly forward slash speak with Billy and be happy to give uh, three, 30 minutes of my time and we can just uh, hash things out, man. And uh, Ruben, man, I, I, like I said, I really appreciate everything that you're doing. I love the vibe that you have with your team and the value that you're bringing to so many people. And I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of my story with you uh, and the entire tribe. So thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Oh man, Billy, we're as good as the guests that we get on our platform. So thank you for making the time. I know we're long over to working on different time zones, etc. cetera. Uh, this was real. You over delivered within the time that we had. So I'm going to let you drop my friend, but on that note, just like that, we are out.